Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to Bridge Books. This is one of the very few book launches we've had since lockdown. So it's so wonderful to see people in this, like, this space ready to talk about reading and writing and meeting with authors. Um, this is um, part of the Rand Club um, book day. So you guys also have time to walk around the building and explore everything else that's in this space. If you went straight up, you'd be in the library. We were up two floors, just to imagine for those of you who have been around already. Um, and what we've got uh, for this panel is a group of short story writers who have each, um, so there's a chair moving up and down the stairs while I was trying to push it. Um, so it's a collection of love stories from around mm -hmm. Africa. It was a pan African competition, and we have three of the selected writers who are local, which is amazing. I think says so much about. Johannesburg and the quality of reading and writing that happens here in the city, which is one of the things that I tell people about all the time. Like our reading and writing culture is amazing, and we don't give ourselves credit. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, because we've got three people, we're going to give each person a chance to read a little bit from their story, tell us a little bit about the section that they're reading, um, why they've chosen that passage. Um, when we're done with everybody having a chance to read, then we're going to open it up to questions. There's going to be some snacks coming down or up at some point. Um, yeah, and feel free, I think, to jump in and ask a question in the meantime. Um, so we're going to start with Cynthia Tisasami, who is, this is her second published short story. Um, However, she's got two novels in the bank. Um, and we're going to hand it over to you. So do you want to tell us a little bit about Shabazz? Yes. Um, so the story was written in 2016 um, when um, my dad became ill. Um, and I think it shook me into reality that ties on now. It showed me my own vulnerability. So I, I think within three months, I wrote 12 short stories. Um, and yeah, it was just a regurgitating of, you know, everything that's been in me. And it's been quite a journey since then. Uh, publication's quite slow. Um, the whole process, you know, it's painfully slow, but I'm enjoying it. Uh, Shiva Eye is one of the stories that's always been in my head from childhood. You know, I can remember my mother telling me stories. It's more like folk tales and that sort of thing. So. It's written with that sort of um, naivety of, um, um, you know, of folk tales, a sort of innocence. But hopefully, you know, the, the hidden truths of them come through as well. So, yeah. And so when are you going to read to us? I'm going to read. Um, I'm, I'm going to read off my Kindle. Yes, my eyesight's not as good as Jared is here again. So yeah. So this is a passage from um, what has happened previously is that the main character Chandra had moved into her in-laws' home, which was a common thing in Indian uh, culture back in the sixties. So she's moved in, and unfortunately, she's not too happy. Um, you know, the new house rules, uh, she misses her old life. So this is now her um, in her new life. But as time passed, Chandra secret secretly became depressed. She missed her old way of life. She longed for the carefree days of sitting under the blossoming champa tree in her parents' garden and reading English classics. She missed the feeling of freedom that came with not having to always worry about the gods. They were constantly on her mind in this new home of hers, for in every room she entered, 
every corner she cleaned. Images of Hindu gods stared unrelentingly at her, their unblinking eyes following her every movement. There was even a wall calendar with a picture of Lord Shiva hanging next to her marital bed. It didn't seem to bother her husband, but in the hot, darkened room late at night, when in the throes of heated lovemaking, Chandra would open her eyes to find the blue god, Lord Shiva, staring down at her, his unwavering eyes like two white hot coals burning into her shameful, naked flesh. Through the moonlight that cast long shadows across their tiny bedroom, Chandra would see Lord Shiva bow down over her nakedness, ready to strike her heart with his scepter which he held deftly in one of his six hands. The powerful cobra around his neck, ready to strike too. <laughs> Eventually, on reflection, Chandra decided that she could endure the changes that came with her new home. She could endure the unrelenting gaze of the plethora of idols that stared at her all day long. She could deal with the hot white eyes of Lord Shiva that watched her at night as she made love to her husband. She could deal with these things. She didn't even mind waking up at 4 a.m. each morning to do the daily chores and prayers. She wished the weight of doing good, being good, and living without sin would be lifted off her shoulders if only for the day. What Chandra couldn't deal with was the no-meat diet that she was restricted to. <laughs> she was tired of eating bland vegetables night and day. Of all the things that she thought she'd miss, meat had been the least of her worries. But now she found that it was this one thing she missed the most. She longed to eat a piece of meat, and she longed for the thick, juicy piece of beef steak most of all. Chandra yearned for the sizzle of red meat in a pan. <laughs> she craved to see the tender pink of a cut of meat turning a succulent, earthy brown as it fried. She hankered to see the thin rind of fat surrounding the meat melt like butter and pop as it sighed over a high flame. She yearned to experience again the delicious wisps of steam that curled up from the pan, assaulting the senses and wetting the appetite. This was what Chandra longed for the most. This was what she craved above all other things. As the months passed, her yearning for meat became an obsession. Chandra's daytime thoughts were consumed with visions of tiny pieces of beef sizzling in a pan. Whilst washing the many murtis in milk on a Friday afternoon, she would smack her lips in glee as she made a mental list of the many steak dishes she had previously enjoyed. And poor Titu too, the beloved pet cow at the Swami's home, became a regular part of Chandra's obsessive <laughs> fantasies of sinking her teeth into a chunk of meat. <laughs> Chandra would spend hours grooming the cow, brushing her hide and stroking her lovely hair. <laughs> it became her favorite task to do. And all the while, as she stroked and petted the fat and luscious titu, she wondered how many fine cuts of meat she would yield. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to have a love story that's joy and a love of food too and not, and not all romantic love so tell us why did you choose that passage for us what does that speak to you about well it's basically i think when the topic came of love i think we think very conventionally of love between a husband and wife but this um was love for food as you said a love for the gods uh, for your religion uh, love between a mother and father, um, you know, your old ways of life, your memories. It's just a celebration. It was a celebration of love and life, um, the many layers of it. So in life, we go on this journey and, you know, it's, it's, if it's not filled with love, it doesn't have to be the love between lovers, you know. It can be the love of books. And that can in itself be fulfilling, a fulfilling life. So that was the whole. That was the whole. Yeah. Nice. It's nice to think about the boundaries for competition and little broken world facts, and then we're kind of cranking out Disney stories that we might have known a hundred years ago too. It's so cool.
She's a novice short story writer. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I think the writing is all great. Um, what are you going to do today? Um, well, um, I didn't. sitting with Christina, eating lunch on the opposite side of the plus, seems to be at the center of the Antwerp summer day. Philippe loiters nearby, pretending to look at the sculpture of Rubens and wondering what she's eating. Since she came, he follows her around like Pluto's beating heart, a dwarf planet. She doesn't seem to notice him. The two women are wrapped up in their conversation. The sunlight that falls on them seems a little brighter, but that might just be her. A little Arab in a cheap sports jacket approaches her. He's carrying a bag filled with odd shaped objects. The new girl becomes animated and hands over money. The salesman hands her three of the objects. They look like loofers. They are loofers. How it's strange that she's excited about loofers. He's been watching her since she arrived on Tuesday. Duke. He tells himself to get used to saying her name. One day he will say it aloud. He will say, Duke, would you like? He can't imagine what he could offer her. She seems so complete. She seems to like reading magazines. She's fair in that transparent European way, and the light also seems to radiate from within. He has heard her complaining about the air condition. She suffers from allergies. He feels his pocket. Three fat um, 10 euro coins slide greasily against each other. Alert to Philip, Philippe's subtle nod and the gendarmes patrolling nearby, the Arab casually moves closer to Philippe. He hands over the coin and stuffs his pockets with the contraband. contraband. Seeing that it spoils the, the line of his suit, he spends the rest of his lunch money on a small notebook and pen from a papeterie. When the, with the loofers in the plastic bag, elegance is restored. Joker and Christina have left their games. He looks at his phone, three minutes to two. Lunchtime is over and he can't get into trouble with Corson. The boss hates him enough. He walk runs into the mouth of the squat building with the gold letters Geluk embossed across its forehead and leaps for the lift. He holds the doors for Duca and Christina coming from the ladies' room. She inclines her head briefly in acknowledgement and turns to Christina. In Africa, people use them all the time, Duca says, holding the loofah up. Their skins gleamed like silk, the Africans. Her eyes glance towards him and he blushes. So you lived in Africa, he smiles. She reddens. Yes, I lived there for most of my childhood. I love Africans. My name is Philippe Moama, he says, offering his hand. Duke of Realize, her hand is soft and passive in his. He includes Christina in a warm, protective gaze. I'm sure I'm not the first to do this, but welcome to Fia. I hope it brings you as much happiness as it does our planet. Christina scuffles as I fall. Her lips opens and exhales them to the guest. She loves Africans, flutter the blind. She loves Africans, <laughs> says the photocopy machine with a gush. <laughs> she loves Africans. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I'd also just like to acknowledge our former students, there's two 
uh, former MN students who have just submitted. <laughs> one, of them is a, one of them is a great uh, crime writer. <laughs> Kurt is a crime writer, and then his mind has got a new book that's coming as well. So, yeah, no, we're all on a journey, right? We don't, we don't know. We're all just trying something. And it's reassuring the stories sometimes. Take a long path and still find a way forward. Yeah, don't throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jerry Cantor. Um, I'm having a difficult time here, I think, if I'm not doing this well, so I'm just going to try one more time. Um, so you are the winner. Congratulations. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thank you. so much that happened last year during lockdown that uh, we couldn't celebrate because we were all trapped at home. It's nice mm -hmm. that we can do all these things now. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have Coach of the Week, so I think that's really you, Solomon. But um, what part are you in this for us? Yeah, so my, my story called Good Help is Hard to Find, and it's basically about, um, and follows the life of Pamela, a domestic worker with her who worked at a house in Saxon World and the, the, the passage that I'm going to read is so she, she sort of overhears that her employer is, is having an affair, Mrs. De Villiers is having an affair outside of a marriage and with another woman and Pamela, the, the part before this section, she spends all night trying to think of what is this woman like that would make a person like Mrs. De Villiers step out of her marriage in this section, she actually meets the, the woman for the first time. So yeah. When I get to the de Villiers' house, I notice a woman standing outside, dressed in black sweatpants, a floral blouse, and black army boots. Hello, can I help you? Oh, thank God, finally someone. Yes, I just came to drop this dress off for Carrion. Is she here? She must just be finishing up with a yoga class by now. Wow, you really know her schedule, don't you? She's a schedule kind of person. Manuel should be here, though. Manuel! Eventually, Manuel comes around from the back and presses the remote to let us both in. Do you want to wait inside for her? I'm sure she'll be home soon. Is Mr. De Villiers here? I doubt it. He's usually out quite early. Then sure, why not? We walk together along the cobbled pathway, past the rose bushes and chrysanthemums. The woman strolls lazily behind me. What's your name, by the way? I ask as I let myself in through the garage, feeling like the lady of the house. <laughs> it's Nina. They must really trust you if you have your own key. Oh yes, I've been working here for a while, I tell her, not explaining that this set of keys only gives me access to a small portion of the bottom half. The house. We walk inside and I seat her by the kitchen counter and pour her a glass of orange juice. It shouldn't be long now, I tell her, hoping that Mrs. De Villiers shows up soon. Sure, I could have just taken the dress from her and left it at that, but I wanted to invite her in. I hope you don't mind me saying, but you're quite beautiful. Her words take me by surprise as I put the orange juice in front of her. And you say you've been working here a while. What did you say your name was? It's Pam. Pamela. Pamela, she says, letting the syllables fall lightly over her lips. Listen, I don't have a good gauge for what's appropriate or not, but I'd really like to feature you in a photographic exhibition I'm doing. It's called Cleaning, and basically, I want to document the lives of people like you, who work in the houses of people who live in the suburbs of Joburg. What? This all takes me by surprise, and I step back to compose myself. Yes, but it's not just about you as a cleaner. I want to capture you in your best dresses, when you're out with your friends, or when you're just at home with your family cooking a meal. 
I want to get at the texture of your life and let it come through in photography. Does that make sense? Her words wash over me as I watch her body contort in enthusiasm, her hands moving left and right. I'm still trying to, tra to wrap my mind around all of it when the book of poetry that I carry with me everywhere slips out of my uniform's pocket. Nina reaches down to pick it up before I can get to it. A collection of the most moving love poetry, she reads. That's cute. She hands it back to me just before Miss, Mrs. Devilius walks in. Nina, she says, putting her hand back down. Carrying. I walk out the kitchen, pretending not to sense the building tension in the air. But it wasn't the tension I expected it would be. The woman sat in the kitchen all morning, moving from cups of tea to glasses of gin and tonic, just talking. Later, when I took my afternoon tea next to Joseph's hut, I noticed that another young man was sitting there. What happened to Joseph? Is he sick? You didn't hear? He got mugged on his way home last night. Oh my God, is he okay? He will be, but he was beaten up pretty badly. I'm his replacement. Is he going to come back here? Ish, I don't know. The bosses don't like it when we put them in situations like this. But it wasn't his fault. Still, you know, he raises his hand as if I should know what he means. I'm too disturbed to piss on for more details, so I go back inside. I saw them. While drinking my tea in one of the guest bedrooms, I saw Mrs. De Villiers and Nina through the window behind the tennis court fence. I could only see the top half of their bodies, but from the way Mrs. De Villiers was reacting, I knew Nina's hand was somewhere it shouldn't be. I watched Mrs. De Villiers turn her face up to the blue sky, wince, then bow her head on Nina's shoulders as if crying. All the while, Nina's gaze was fixed on her, briefly taking moments to look around to make sure no one was watching. Um, so I guess just to start, like, there's the one line in there that I think kind of reflects the whole book, too, about like love stories, where it talks, you know, that somehow when the idea that we're going to write love stories, it's like there's a weird boundary with romance novels, which somehow are also lesser because of genre fiction, but people read them and love them, and they're like, we all, we all do. <laughs> um, and whether it's romance or crime novels or I read trashy sci-fi, like we all have other things that we read that aren't considered to be high literature. But I guess, how did you guys kind of wrap your, did you have to wrap your minds around that? Did you feel like that's a thing when you're writing that you knew there's a call out for love stories? And how do you kind of navigate that well? Like how do you figure it out? And the difference between a love story and a lot of that, I guess, like that there's all those boundaries to think about too. No one. <laughs> <laughs> to think about genre because what you're asking is about genre right and and about the difference between popular fiction and i mean it's and not feeling bad about that because i could i kind of find it like false lines you know that i agree um i agree and i i also don't think it helps to be self-consciously trying to be a good writer you know a literary writer your writing is so hard you know it's just i find very blocking to try and, and be a literary writer. Like I really just try and tell the story, which is difficult enough as it is. Um, I don't know, what do you think? Well, for me, for this story in particular, uh, I wrote the story before I saw the call to come out for, for love stories, and then I was thinking of something to submit, and then this was the most recent story I'd written, and I was like, oh wait, there is love in here. You know, you can see. So I think uh, on what Philip was saying, it's, it's helpful to to write what's there, the story, and then think about where it fits oh, after. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think for me, um, romance. When I started writing, <coughs> I gravitated towards the romance and love because it's the fastest and biggest selling <laughs> genre out there. So if you're gonna make it, it's in that genre. Um, well, in my opinion, you know, lots of people are gonna pick up. Romance is our bestseller. It's in fiction. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
it that drew me to it but i think i also wanted to write stories with people of color in them and just love stories where there's no um tragedy or you know just black people or people of color falling in love and having happily ever after um without the tragedy and you know the whole strife and you know that sort of thing mm. so for me that's the whole you know there's a big hole in the the the, the romance that you read you know which the the whole entire romance um um you know romantia land is starting to take note of where people of color aren't being represented so a book like this for me it shows that um we love in a particular way um we love deeply as well as africans um so for me it was it's a beautiful book in, in there's so many different every story is different and the love is expressed differently so i think you know that the gaps exist across so many kinds of writing too you know like you know, and it's like the gaps in nonfiction where it's like wow well, she made the list of books coming out and it's still lots of you know like the same people made of sex you know and all of that is so important to address but also i find uh, you know when i'm talking with people about their stories they say oh you know you have mostly african writers and Actually, I don't know. Like, I actually read much. Like, that's totally true. You know, yeah. people have an idea of what they're going to find, mm -hmm. and then actually going to point them to things like this. But there's like a hundred different books that we could point them. That is, so it's completely not that. Like, it's like all actually like these kind of heavy bound yeah. things. You know. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other interesting thing to me, like, I can't write short stories. So I'm very impressed that you guys have. Like, <laughs> Done this so well because I um, I can write short news items, I can write short nonfiction, I can write really, really long, so I can just keep talking, but then to write short and fit an entire story into just a few pages is its own special challenge. So I mean, if you guys want to talk about that for a little bit, you know, this idea of like how do you how do you distill something into its essence so that it's so you get the entire story into just these little bits. Because I love a short story, and it's been really, short stories have been so helpful for me this year when I struggled to pay attention to longer, I couldn't focus through a long book. And short stories were my foray back into reading. It's like, I can read one, and I can put it down, and I'll come back to the next one when I'm ready. And it's this whole other little meal that I eat, so I don't have to worry about remembering where I have to. And I love the way that you said meal, because there's something really satisfying about finishing a text. Mm. Like from the beginning to the end, and where you actually, you know, following these characters through this journey, and in some way also following your own journey, you know, and revising, you know, and 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 so I I really I really like um, that idea of a meal, and I love also food. <laughs> <laughs> disembodied like everything the technology and everything is driving us away from our bodies and, and 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 so anything that takes us back to that i just feel it's i just i'm so i love that you know i just love that and the nice thing about the, the short story form is and you like you're saying that it's sort of a fast-paced life it's something that you know okay i can sit for a good 30 minutes and give myself to this story and I don't like, as opposed to maybe a novel, um, which takes a lot longer. Um, uh, but I actually think of, I find, so I'm currently working on my first debut novel, but I find short stories as like a nice balance between, between the length of, it's, some, it's sort of like an exercise, like if I'm thinking of a situation that I want to explore, a short story is a nice sort of, Petri dish to play around with because of the constraints in length, mm -hmm. I think. Whereas a novel just asks, asks a whole different set of expectations where you really stay with the character for longer periods of time. I find it so hard to write prose, like the idea of prose. Like a short story, it feels like it's closer to a poem. Mm -hmm. But like to think of writing a novel, 
two dots now. Two, two dots <laughs> with pride. Because I just like, you know, my attention span. I don't know. What do you think, Sophia? Well, I think I don't have the the knowledge or the the the, the degree, you know, that for creative writing or anything. I see a competition and I know that it's five thousand words. <laughs> I strive for that. Yeah. If it goes over then but I think the important part is the editing part. Yeah. Um I, I realize writing is easy. It's the editing that really is the you know, is the difficult part. You have yep. to cut down and revise and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I know in short stories it's normally a thousand you get to five hundred, two thousand words, five thousand, and then about ten thousand. Mm. And that for me is my, you know. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. So and you're correct in sort of like if you're shooting for you're striving for a certain word limit and you tell your mind every right in your mind is a reading page and you say these are the plot points that I want to reach. And you get the shift. Of it. Yeah. yeah. Where it's shifting. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Who else? What would you guys like to know? I think I'm going to, it's not really a question, it's a comment. Um, I find it really exciting to now have such a wide selection of books and stories and stuff written by people who look like me, who don't have the need to explain things. So for example, like you're talking about Shiva's eyes. And in your story, you're not explaining, in, in a way you are, but you're not then having a footnote to say what Shiva is, because if you were not him, then dude, go look it up, you know? <laughs> and like, Jared, recently I read one of your other stories, I, I don't know the name, it's the Persister Aunties. Yeah, Persister. And, um, and they have the flats, and they've got like a secret code. Uh, what's the name of that flat? Cook Sister, yeah. Oh, is it called Cook yeah. Sister? <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it's so cool to read the story, and I actually can place myself in that auntie's flat, I can smell the persistence <laughs> on the children at school on Monday because they live in a house where the baby, they, this isn't in the story, this is just comes to me. <laughs> on a Sunday, when their uniform is being dried like uh, in the house or being washed or whatever, the mother is so busy frying and syrupping the sisters that their clothes all smell like the sisters. <laughs> and so for me to read a story like that, I think, this is my real life, you know, and and, and I, I'm, I'm so excited to see all of you. Uh, that's more of a comment. It's not really a question. It's a comment, yeah. But you can comment on the comment. <laughs> <laughs> I love your comment because I really struggle because I don't come from any culture like your culture. Like, <laughs> we look alike, but we're not the same. <laughs> so, so, like, my references are European. You know, and, and I've grown up, and that's why I've written this really, really uptight character who is such a coconut. Mm -hmm. He's like a deep, <laughs> an utter co coconut. And so, in a sense, I really value the opportunity to be able to, to put that into the context. Because when it gets put into like say a sort of mainstream typical context then you feel like you're an exception that's been brought in to represent okay now we can now we can say that we're a representative because we're not a black person mm -hmm. but so it's i feel much more comfortable to be in a, an african context to tell these stories within an african context because it's a weirdo it's a minority it's kind of awkward actually when I was reading it out loud, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is so problematic. <laughs> <laughs> In so many different levels. But those characters exist. They live in this world. And we just keep our heads down and we just go, we just perform whatever we need to perform in order to get by in the world. But this is also to try and explore what's inside underneath those layers for people that don't look like what they're supposed to look like. <laughs> yeah, and to your comment, I think my journey as a, as a writer has also been like 
making myself aware of, like you say, the, the stories, right, where you are, right, where, like I tell um, um, my students that teach creative art that there is aesthetic, aesthetic value in your cultural background, right, if you look close enough, if you're aware of, of the textures of, of your life, you can bring that into story, so that I like, trace sort of like my trajectory from when I started writing stories, it was, it was more like, okay, maybe more universal, the characters didn't have a lot of texture or depth to them, but I think it really shifted for me when I started listening to the stories of, of family members or really taking note of the conversations that were happening around me in my life and bringing that through um, into my, into my story and looking for these bigger themes. Yeah. I think for me, um, growing up, you always thought exciting things only ever happened in places like London and New York and those where people had things to write about. But I've, I've realized I have so much to give and so many stories to tell. Exciting, intriguing, you know, that people want to read. And um, that for me is an amazing. Yeah. But you know what's also really amazing about both of you is that in your particularity of a culture which is not mainstream, European, whatever, there's, the, uh, the more you delve into the particularity of it, the more universal it becomes. Mm -hmm. It's like, that, oh, we're there. We, we're in that, that, that becomes reality for us. And it, it's just so beautiful to see how that, it's like a balance of power that gets switched for all of us. Mm. Yeah, but so, am I hogging the conversation? Um, I think that for me is so important. <laughs> What's so important is that, first of all, uh, you know, when, you, when, when you're speaking with your own voice and you hear like a woman who's particular voices, what you're doing is you are undoing that cultural superiority that we've been, that we've grown up with, that or cultural, um, uh, what's it, snobbery, that the only culture that counts is middle class white European culture, mm -hmm. right? And even though it might eventually filter down to similarities, you're saying it in your own voice. And, and that's part of unpicking that cultural superiority, but also unpicking our cultural inferiority complex. Mm. It's also part of empowering us all to, to say, I want to have a story. Mm. Stop correcting my fucking accent. Mm. Don't fix my word. That's how we use it. You know? And that's why I think this is so important. Anybody else sorry? <laughs> no, <laughs> not just me. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, um, I think for me, um, yeah, so I read a book recently, and every chapter was um, a story of someone's life. And then the second half of the chapters were kind of justifying the life. And it was very jarring. You know, it was kind of like, now I've got this amazing story, I'm totally immersed in this person's life, and then now I'm going to explain to you why you should enjoy that life. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, you made me not like the book. <laughs> so it's like, you know, you know, I was happy with your life, I was happy, like, you know, like Philip was saying, I think that's becomes my reality then for a little while, like, okay, so I'm not Muslim, but now I am for a little while, and I'm just kind of in your world and seeing things the way that you do it, and it's so much smoother that way to not feel as you have to put a footnote at the end tell me what a Christian story is, even though I may not have known when I arrived in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> but that's right, it's on me to look it up. So. The other thing about this the, this book, I think that, that it does, in terms of identity and blackness, um, and it, it is that it's, it's books, it's stories from Africa, so it disrupts this idea of the African writer and what um, because there's, it, it, I, I think Terry Selassie wrote such a beautiful essay called There's No Such Thing as an African Writer. And she refused the category of an African writer. And Binyavanga Wenana also said how to write about Africans. You know, there was all that stuff about, you know, there had to be a acacia and a sunset and a cover and all of that, all those kind of cliches. But in a sense, that, that stuff is very deeply sort of embedded in, 
in Anglophone literature. So it's like every single book that's written is, like you say, it's like it's like exfoliating um, the 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 nonsense of hegemony. Yeah, like there's more than one story, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And Karen, I just think as a bilingual class person, um, you've just you writing just opened doors and windows, and um, you're exposing people that didn't expect it. You know, I grew up in the country, and it was rare, but um, it was never there. So many windows and doors that are opening and enlightening us and making us laugh and stuff like that. And you just make it. So thank you. <laughs> and one of the great things about the program today, which Alicia had a huge part in organizing too, is that we have such diversity of books. You know, there was nonfiction, and there was love stories, and there were new writers and established writers, and in a very short day you can cover such a huge breadth of writing. And I think also what's really interesting about the competition is that there's new voices, there's people who have been writing for a long time, there's all kinds of people in between who like take time and space to have their story told. Um, I am hungry, so. <laughs> and I will blame Cynthia for that. So, um, the food has arrived, so I'm gonna cut off panel discussion if that's okay, and we will let everybody mingle and have a snack and have a drink and have continue to hang out and talk. <laughs> I know, that would all work for me. <laughs> but thank you guys so much, and let's just applause one more time for everyone. <laughs> Also, oh, yeah, really important detail, these guys want to sign your books. Yeah. So go upstairs, buy a copy of the book, come down, get autographs, do all that fun stuff too. Yeah? Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>